Number 12. Thomas Trantino Native New Yorker Thomas Trantino was born in 1938 and was raised in Brooklyn's Williamsburg neighborhood. Today, it's home to some of the city's most coveted real estate, but back in the 1940s, Williamsburg was a working-class domain and a haven for World War II refugees. It was also somewhat of a rough-and-tumble area. For Trantino, this meant being more educated on street life than academics. By the time he was a teenager, he was a full-blown heroin addict. He was expelled from school for skipping class and spent the bulk of his adolescence in prison for robbery after trying and failing to kick his drug habit twice with professional help. At a cost of roughly $50 per day, around $565 in modern currency, heroin was no cheaper back then than it is now, and Trantino turned to crime to support his addiction. He eventually managed to kick the habit, but replaced it with other expensive vices, including alcohol and amphetamines. After committing a robbery in Brooklyn one evening in 1963, Trantino and his friend Frank Falco went to the Angel Lounge Bar in Lodi, New Jersey. During their visit, someone fired a gun inside the establishment while horsing around. The noise drew the attention of nearby Lodi Sergeant Peter Votto, who was giving new hire Gary Tedesco a preview of what police work was like. Both officers then entered the bar to investigate. While checking IDs, Voto found a gun, at which point Trantino ambushed him from behind at gunpoint and forced him to undress, then beat him to the point where he nearly lost consciousness. In the meantime, Falco took control of Tedesco. Then, without warning, Trantino fatally shot Voto and Tedesco. Realizing the gravity of his friend's actions, Falco immediately began shouting at Trantino, asking, What are you doing? and saying, you're crazy. The two thugs then fled to New York City, where Falco was killed by police a few days later. Trantino turned himself in after spending nearly three days in hiding and was extradited to New Jersey on murder charges. During his trial, he argued that he took a lot of speed and got really drunk on the day of the double homicide and that he didn't remember anything. An expert testified that Trantino was a sociopath, which was most likely true, but not enough to qualify him for an insanity defense. So his lawyer instead pointed the finger at Falco as the alleged shooter, which failed to sway things in his favor. In addition to finding Trantino guilty, the jury voted for him to receive the death penalty for his crimes. After New Jersey outlawed capital punishment in 1971, his sentence was commuted to life with the possibility of parole starting in 1977. The board voted to grant parole if Trantino could prove his ability and plans to pay the restitution he owed to the survivors of his victims. Due to the public backlash surrounding his impending release, the judge refused to set a restitution amount, effectively keeping Trantino in prison on the basis of a legal technicality. His next several bids for parole were denied as the board debated endlessly over whether or not he was rehabilitated. Each time a hearing approached, groups of demonstrators made it abundantly clear that there would be widespread outrage if Trantino were freed. But the board finally approved his parole in 2001, and on his 63rd birthday the following year, Trantino experienced his first steps of freedom in over 38 years. At the time, this made him the longest-serving prisoner in New Jersey history. Number 11. Otis Johnson When Otis Johnson became defiant toward authority as a teen, his father sent him to a monastery in Hong Kong where he spent most of the next decade training in martial arts and learning self-discipline. During the 1970s, he moved back to the United States and settled in Harlem, where he protected his sister from drug dealers she was having problems with. One day in 1975, an NYPD officer was shot down the street from where Johnson was teaching martial arts in Upper Manhattan. The cop survived, though, and someone identified Johnson as the shooter. When cops spotted him in a park and tried to confront him, he resisted arrest and used his martial arts skills to disarm them and take their guns. Johnson would later admit that he handled the situation poorly, but that he thought he was being robbed and reacted instinctively before realizing that the men who'd approached him were cops. He also insisted that he was innocent of the attempted murder. There was no physical evidence connecting Johnson to the crime, but he was ultimately convicted and was sentenced to 25 years to life. 
During his time in prison, Johnson witnessed firsthand how changes in the system during the 1980s made it increasingly difficult for prisoners to access rehabilitative programs and services. As the so-called war on drugs heated up and America's incarceration rates soared, the prison Johnson was in got rid of a program called Pre-Release, which had helped prepare inmates for their re-entry into society. The parole board denied Johnson's bid for freedom five times because he refused to confess, which they perceived as a lack of remorse for a crime he committed. But he stood by his claim that if he seemed unapologetic, it was because he didn't commit the shooting. Johnson ended up spending 44 years in prison before he was paroled in 2014 at the age of 69. He was given an ID, $40, two bus tickets, and some documents detailing his alleged crimes and convictions. He spent a few weeks at a homeless shelter, but with nowhere else to go, he moved into a halfway house in Harlem. For the first few decades in prison, Johnson had kept in touch with several of his family members, including his sisters. But they fell out of touch around 1998, and he was unable to find their contact information upon his release, leaving him pretty much on his own to adjust to life on the outside. He had to catch up with decades' worth of technology, learn how to navigate public transportation, and grasp modern-day prices and economic circumstances. Johnson also had to get used to living without the structure that came with life in prison. After nearly half a century of being told what to do, he had the freedom to go where he wanted, make his own schedule, and live as he pleased. And although Johnson maintains his innocence, his record still carries a conviction. His life is simple. He lives off his social security check, which doesn't cover much more than the basics. But he's found meaning in his spirituality, his volunteer work in a soup kitchen, and helping those in need in other ways. Number 10. Paul Geidel Jr. Born in Hartford, Connecticut to German immigrants in 1894, Paul Geidel Jr. spent the majority of his childhood in orphanages after his father's death in 1900 and dropped out of school at 14. He spent the next few years working low-wage jobs in Hartford and New York City. In 1911, at the age of 17, Geidel robbed and murdered a wealthy 73-year-old broker named William H. Jackson at the Iroquois Hotel in Manhattan, where he'd once worked as a bellhop. After suffocating Jackson to death with chloroform in his hotel room, Geidel made off with just a few dollars. Two days later, authorities arrested him on suspicion of second-degree murder. He was convicted of the charge and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. His sentence was shortened due to good behavior, but before Geidel could have his first parole hearing, he was declared legally insane. He was then relocated from Sing Sing to a state hospital for the criminally insane, where he remained until 1972. Geidel was then moved to a prison for elderly inmates, where he befriended some of the facility's officials who occasionally took him to baseball games and on other outings. In an odd twist, Geidel became so comfortable with incarcerated life that he didn't want to be released when he was offered parole in 1974. By then, he was 80 years old, had no family to speak of, and had spent 63 years of his life behind bars. It was pretty much all he knew at that point, and he was afraid he wouldn't be able to make it in the outside world. In 1974, while speaking to reporters from the New York Times, Geidel said that he was treated well at his current facility. He described Sing Sing as an unpleasant place, but said that he deserved it because he took a good man's life. Geidel seemed truly remorseful for his actions, stating that he couldn't fathom how he was capable of such horrific violence in his younger years. Then in 1980, Geidel finally left prison and re-entered society. Having spent more than 68 years behind bars, he served the longest prison sentence in US history. As he left the facility, he politely told reporters that he didn't want any publicity. He lived out his remaining years quietly at a nursing home and passed away in 1987 at the age of 93. Number 9. Ricky Jackson Born into a working-class family in 1957, Ricky Jackson grew up on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. He joined the U.S. Marines at 18, but he lasted less than a year due to a back problem. Shortly after returning to Ohio in 1975, Jackson was accused of co-conspiring with brothers Ronnie and Wiley Bridgman 
to murder and rob a money order salesman named Harold Franks. According to witnesses, two black men approached Franks outside a grocery store and threw acid in his face before shooting him twice. They then took his briefcase and fled the scene in a waiting getaway car. Ricky and the Bridgman brothers lived in the neighborhood, but they weren't anywhere near the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. All three men were law-abiding members of the community with no criminal record, and there was no physical evidence connecting them to the shooting. Despite all signs pointing away from them being the killers, authorities chose to believe the eyewitness claims of a 12-year-old paperboy named Eddie Vernon. There were no other witnesses capable of identifying the suspects, and there were reasons to suspect that Eddie's version of events was unreliable. He'd failed to identify the suspects in a lineup, and several of Eddie's peers claimed that he wasn't even at the crime scene at the time of the murder. And yet, prosecutors moved forward with using Eddie as a witness, and the judge approved his testimony. Based on little Eddie's story alone, the court convicted all three defendants and sentenced them to death. Ricky Jackson was nailed for being the alleged shooter, while Ronnie Bridgman was found guilty of being the second man involved in the attack. Wiley, on the other hand, was only convicted of driving the getaway car. The trio's sentences were eventually commuted to life in prison. During his time behind bars, Ricky Jackson never stopped advocating for his innocence. He wrote letters to journalists, reporters, filmmakers, and anyone else who he thought might be able to draw attention to his case. Wiley Bridgman was paroled in 2002, but was soon returned to prison on a parole violation after he accidentally crossed paths with Eddie Vernon, who he was banned from having any contact with. Ronnie Bridgman, who now goes by the name Kwame Ajamu, was paroled in 2003. After using his time in prison to focus on his education, he used his credentials to land an office job, and in 2004, he got married and bought a house. Cleveland Scene magazine published journalist Kyle Swenson's investigative report about the case in 2011. It drew the attention of Eddie Vernon's pastor, who arranged for Eddie to meet with attorneys working with the Ohio Innocence Project. As it turned out, he tried to recant his version of events before the case went to trial, but police told him it was too late to back out and allegedly intimidated him into testifying against the suspects. Now an adult, Eddie formally recanted his testimony, and in 2014, all three convictions were overturned. Ricky and Wiley were released from prison, and the trio were fully exonerated. After languishing behind bars for 39 years, Ricky Jackson holds the record for being the longest wrongfully held prisoner in U.S. history. In 2020, the city of Cleveland agreed to pay a total of $18 million to the wrongfully convicted men. Unfortunately, though, Wiley Bridgman passed away in 2021 from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, complications. In 2022, a documentary about Jackson's experience called Lovely Jackson was released, but he's otherwise stayed largely out of the spotlight in recent years as he focuses on making up for lost time. Number 8. Chester Vega. Frances Murphy, Mildred Lindquist, and Lillian Oting were the wives of prominent Chicago businessmen. In 1960, they disappeared during a girl's trip to Starved Rock State Park in LaSalle County, Illinois. After leaving for a hike, the women never returned, and nobody realized they were missing until days later when Frances Murphy's husband called the police to report her disappearance. During a search, the women's bound and partially disrobed bodies were found in a cave. All three of them had been bludgeoned to death by a nearby tree limb, which was covered in blood. Employees at the lodge where the victims were staying were quick to mention that one of their co-workers, a dishwasher named Chester Vega, had shown up for his shift with scratches on his face. Vega had a criminal history, but denied any involvement in the triple murder, claiming that he was getting a haircut when it happened and that the scratches on his face were from shaving. He cooperated with authorities and passed three polygraph exams, but remained under heavy suspicion as the investigation played out. Under pressure from investigators, Vega confessed to the crime. He almost immediately recanted, claiming that he'd written a confession under duress and that detectives had threatened him. But the damage was done, 
and Vega was indicted on three counts of murder. During his trial, his lawyer argued that police had told Vega they'd convict him on circumstantial evidence, even if he didn't confess, and that he'd be sent to the electric chair. But the jury still found Vega guilty of murder and sentenced him to life in prison after voting to reject the state's recommendation for the death sentence. Vega maintained his innocence throughout his incarceration and even after becoming eligible for parole, which meant that he didn't show the kind of remorse that a parole board typically looks for. After being denied parole multiple times, he was granted freedom in 2019. He was released after serving 59 years, making him Illinois' longest-serving prisoner in history at the time. In 2022, a re-examination of evidence from the crime turned up a male DNA profile that didn't belong to Vega, but to this day, the identity of the individual remains a mystery. Number 7. Charles Edward Ford Emma Washington and her nephew, Vincent Lewis, were walking to their home in La Plata, Maryland one day in 1952 when a gunman opened fire on them. A bullet traveled through Emma's head and into Lewis, and when the shot failed to kill Lewis, the attacker took the butt of his gun and bludgeoned the young man to death. 19-year-old Charles Edward Ford was accused of the crime, but adamantly denied any involvement. He claimed that he was on furlough from the U.S. Air Force and insisted he was at a dance nowhere near the crime scene with his girlfriend and brother. Police didn't believe the young man, though, who'd later claim that he was coerced into confessing to Lewis's murder. Ford faced an all-white jury which consisted of at least one person who knew him, who for some reason was still allowed to serve. He also had poor representation, and none of his alibi witnesses were called to testify in his defense. Even as the prosecution's witnesses offered contradictory statements, he knew that as a young black man in America, things likely wouldn't turn out in his favor. The inconsistencies that were apparent throughout the trial seemed to be overlooked and Ford was found guilty of first-degree murder, and as a result he was sentenced to life in prison. In an unrelated case, Ford was accused of brutally assaulting a young woman who escaped her attacker when her sister overheard her screams for help. The suspect fled the scene, but a car that was rented in Ford's name was found nearby. At the time, Ford was unaware that he had the option of appealing his cases. He finally took advantage of the legal recourse available to him in 2014 and fought for new trials. The district attorney fought against a new murder trial being granted, arguing that Ford committed a horrific act of violence violence and that the victim still deserves justice. Ford's defense lawyer, William Ranahan, emphasized the distinct possibility that racism was a factor in the outcome of his first murder trial. After all, it happened at a time when segregation was in full swing, yet the jury consisted entirely of white people. Eventually, the court granted Ford a new trial for both the murder and assault cases. The judge overseeing the case suspended all but 63 years and nine months of Ford's sentence. With credit for time served, it made him a free man. In making his decision, the judge considered how Ford would have likely been paroled in the 1970s if he hadn't picked up the assault charge. Ford took an Alford plea in the assault case, which meant that he maintained his innocence while acknowledging that there was likely enough evidence against him to secure a conviction. After spending 64 years behind bars, making him the longest-serving inmate in Maryland history, Ford left prison and moved into a nursing home. Number 6. Francis Clifford Smith Born in 1925 in Norriton, Connecticut, Francis Clifford Smith became a habitual petty criminal as an adult. In 1950, he was imprisoned for the murder of 68-year-old Grover Hart, a night watchman at a yacht club along the Greenwich shore. He denied committing the crime, but nevertheless remained behind bars for 70 years, with the exception of two short-lived stints of freedom. In 1967, Clifford Smith escaped from prison. He managed to evade authorities for 12 days before he was recaptured. During the 1970s, he was paroled, but he violated the terms of his release and was sent back to prison. In more recent years, Clifford Smith was relocated to a prison designated specifically for aging inmates. According to the Greenwich Time newspaper, he was hesitant to accept parole when it was offered, but in 2020, he accepted placement at a nursing home for parolees. To this day, Clifford Smith holds the distinction of being the longest-serving prisoner in Connecticut history. Richard Sparaco, the executive director for the state's Board of Pardons and Paroles, told the Greenwich Times shortly after Clifford Smith's release that his parole seemed to be going smoothly 
and that there hadn't been any issues so far. Many officials today believe that Clifford Smith's case was wildly mishandled back in the mid-20th century, and that he's innocent like he claims. According to records, two shooters were involved in the killing of Grover Hart. One of the perpetrators, George Loudon, implicated Clifford Smith after being offered a plea deal. Some believe that Loudon was simply trying to satisfy the demands of the deal, but he'd later claim that law enforcement forced him to name Clifford Smith as his accomplice. An eyewitness in the case recanted her testimony, and a convict named David Blumetti reportedly came forward and took responsibility for being involved in Hart's murder. But these details were conveniently glossed over, and the trial against Clifford Smith proceeded. The number of aging prisoners is increasing in the US, posing unique questions about how to manage the elderly incarcerated population. This spike results directly from the heavy-handed punishments that were doled out to convicted felons in America during the 1980s and 90s. In recent years, Connecticut lawmakers have lowered the requirements and expanded the parole options for the sake of granting compassionate release to more elderly prisoners. They've also taken steps toward considering other factors when deciding whether to grant parole to aging inmates, including whether keeping them locked up is in the best interests of justice. Number 5. Louis Boy During the early days of modern medicine, researchers learned by experimenting on human test subjects, which often included prisoners. In many cases, participants weren't thoroughly informed of what was going to be done to them. One of the strangest experiments that a volunteer ever knowingly consented to happened in 1949. A Sing Sing prisoner who was serving a life sentence named Louis Boy allowed doctors to mix his blood with the blood of a girl who was suffering from leukemia named Marcia Slater. The purpose of the project was to see if mixing the blood would cleanse the leukemia patient's blood or if it would perhaps cause Boy to develop the disease. It was also a last-ditch effort to save Slater's life after all other forms of treatment had failed to do so. Over a four-day period, a medical team passed 16 pints of blood back and forth between Boy and the patient. The experiment failed to save Slater's life, but revealed no ill effects on Boy's part. He never developed leukemia, and in that aspect, the endeavor was considered a success. This was just one of multiple medical experiments that Boy volunteered for while he was in prison. After being convicted of the murder of a cashier in 1931, despite his claims of innocence, he was initially sentenced to the electric chair, even though he had no prior convictions. But Boy's sentence was commuted to life in prison, courtesy of New York's governor at the time, Franklin D. Roosevelt. In 1942 and 1943, several years before the blood swap, Boy participated in dangerous malaria and influenza experiments. The Italian-born convict's contributions were so highly appreciated and valued that Governor Thomas E. Dewey commuted his life sentence to time served. And after spending 18 years behind bars, Boy had gone from facing the death penalty to being a free man although he remained on lifelong parole. After the leukemia experiment, the 51-year-old said that he planned to continue volunteering as a guinea pig for the field of medicine. He told the New York Times in 1950 that he hoped his participation would help save lives, and he commended the doctors who treated him for their wonderful bedside manner. Number 4. Glenn Ford it's estimated that as many as one out of every four death row prisoners in the United States is innocent. A young man named Glenn Ford became one such statistic in 1984 when he was accused of robbing and murdering a Louisiana jeweler named Isadora Roseman. He faced an all-white jury after prosecutors took action to remove any black jurors from serving and was convicted of the charges. After fighting as hard as he possibly could for his innocence, Ford was sent to death row and the prosecutor Marty Stroud went out on the town to celebrate the verdict. During the trial, Stroud had argued that Ford's past as a petty thief and his history of doing yard work for the victim pointed toward his guilt in Roseman's murder. Ford had also been caught pawning some of the items that were stolen during the homicide. But there was no murder weapon or witnesses connecting Ford to the crime scene, and Stroud had chosen not to follow up on leads about other possible suspects. Simply put, the prosecutor got tunnel vision, and he was so hungry for a conviction that he overlooked details that were extremely unfair to ignore. Stroud was also well aware that Ford's lawyers didn't specialize in criminal defense, and he enjoyed the advantage their inexperience gave him. 
Ford spent the next three decades languishing mostly in solitary confinement, becoming one of America's longest-serving death row prisoners. The conditions he was subjected to were isolated, cramped, and often stifling. He was slated for execution several times, but managed to avoid being put to death while he appealed his case. Meanwhile, life was good for Stroud whose career really took off after his victory in Ford's case. He finally fell off his high horse in 2015, though, when a man named Jake Robinson confessed to being responsible for the murder to a police informant. As a result, Ford was cleared of any involvement in the crime and was released from prison with a $24 gift card. Under Louisiana law, he was entitled to as much as $330,000 for the wrongful conviction. But a judge who was unconvinced of Ford's innocence denied his request for compensation. So Ford moved into housing for released prisoners and died penniless. In a column for the Shreveport Times in 2015, Stroud accepted full responsibility for his role in wrongfully securing Ford's conviction and death sentence. He admitted that he failed to consider information that may have led the case in other directions and the fact that Ford lacked proper representation. Stroud also acknowledged that some of the evidence he introduced during the trial turned out to be based on junk science. He apologized to Ford for his behavior, which he described in hindsight as arrogant, judgmental, and narcissistic. He also stated that he was more interested in winning the case than he was in justice. Ford kept his response to the apology short and to the point, stating, I'm sorry, I cannot forgive you, which is understandable, considering the level of suffering he endured and the fact that his entire adulthood was taken away from him for something he didn't do. Number 3. The Hooded Men as the next item on today's list shows, sometimes it's not the length of the sentence that makes it surprising that someone lived through it, but the brutality of the punishment. From the 1960s until 1998, Northern Ireland experienced a period of conflict known as the Troubles. In a nutshell, it stemmed from a centuries-old disagreement between nationalists, who are mostly Catholic and want Ireland to be its own country, and predominantly Protestant Unionists, who want to remain part of Great Britain. On August 9, 1971, 342 Catholic civilians were ripped from their homes before dawn and taken prisoner by the British Army. Codenamed Operation Demetrius, the mission's goal was to apprehend people who were suspected of having ties to a group called the Irish Republican Army. Captives endured brutal treatment, including being forced to exercise to the point of exhaustion. They were also threatened with dogs, forced to run barefoot over glass shards and gravel, thrown out of low-flying helicopters, and outright beaten. Most prisoners were eventually released and reunited with their families. But 14 specifically chosen men remained in custody without explanation, in some cases for years. Known as the Hooded Men, they were subjected to brutal interrogations that were carried out using a handful of torture methods called the Five Techniques. The methods included sleep deprivation, food deprivation, loud noise, and sensory deprivation, the latter of which often consisted of forcing the captives to wear cloth hoods over their heads. In one room known as the music box, the prisoners were subjected to constant irritating noise and stifling heat, the kind that makes a person sweat buckets while standing perfectly still. And at the same time, there was another room that was freezing cold. The men were also forced to stand with their fingertips touching a wall for prolonged periods. If they moved even a little bit, they were beaten. And if their interrogators were dissatisfied with their answers during questioning, the same punishment was doled out. The prisoners were even denied a toilet, giving them no chance but to soil themselves and continue wearing the dirty clothing. Even during the early stages of their imprisonment, the hooded men became traumatized and disoriented, and their mental and physical states only worsened as the abuse wore on. The mistreatment took an especially worrisome toll on older prisoners who were often unable to speak or walk properly after enduring a certain amount of physical abuse. Several of the prisoners were plagued by hallucinations that continued for years or even decades after their eventual release. To this day, it's unknown whether they were drugged, if they just started to go crazy, or perhaps both. In the end, no majorly useful intel was gained by tormenting the prisoners, and for years afterward the British government denied the mistreatment of the prisoners. But it happened, people knew what was going on, 
and the documents to prove it were eventually found. And while the European Court of Human Rights refuses to classify the operation as torture, it has acknowledged that the treatment was inhumane and degrading. Number 2. Alva Campbell Born in Pennsylvania in 1948, Alva Earl Campbell Jr. was one of seven children in his family. The siblings grew up in a highly abusive household and ended up in foster care after they entered a bar one day begging for food. For at least six years prior to turning 18, Campbell bounced between multiple foster homes, residential treatment facilities, and juvenile detention centers. As soon as he became an adult, Campbell began building his rap sheet. By the age of 20, he was convicted of three counts of armed robbery, one count of grand larceny, and shooting with the intent to kill. In 1972, he was convicted of murdering a man during a robbery. Ron O'Brien, the Franklin County, Ohio prosecutor at the time, described Campbell as the poster child for the death penalty. And 25 years later, in 1997, Campbell convincingly faked paralysis. After being wheeled into court one day to face an aggravated robbery charge, he suddenly stood up and overpowered the sheriff's deputy watching over him. Campbell stole the deputy's gun, fled the courtroom, and carjacked 18-year-old Charles Dials. He forced Dials to drive for three hours at gunpoint before fatally shooting the young man for refusing his commands to get on the floor of the vehicle. Police quickly caught up with Campbell and took him back into custody, this time on another murder charge. In the end, he was convicted of the crime and sentenced to death. And after being denied a last-ditch bid for clemency, he was taken into the execution chamber on November 15, 2017. Due to his poor health, including cancer and chronic heart and lung problems, executioners were unable to find a vein. And by then, Campbell was essentially on death's doorstep because of how sick he was. His lawyer had even argued that something like this might happen because his health conditions compromised his veins. But the execution was scheduled to proceed, and staff members did what they could to try making it happen. After trying to find a vein for 30 minutes with no luck, the execution was called off and rescheduled for 2019. Campbell immediately began fighting against the planned lethal injection date, this time arguing that it was cruel and inhumane punishment based on the complications he experienced during his first execution attempt. Just three months after the botched lethal injection, Campbell died in his prison cell from natural causes at 69 years old. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one. Joe Ligon. Born in the late 1930s, Joseph Ligon spent the first several years of his life on a farm in Alabama. He left school in the third or fourth grade without knowing how to read or write and moved to Philadelphia with his family a few years later. In February 1953, Ligon and two of his buddies befriended two other young men and they began drinking together. And when they ran out of booze, they committed robberies to come up with the money to buy more. During their violent alcohol-fueled crime spree, the group murdered two men named Charles Pitts and Jackson Ham, and they injured six others. At trial, Ligon admitted to stabbing one person who survived their injuries, but he denied committing either of the murders and expressed remorse for his actions. Ligon and his accomplices were quickly convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. However, they'd later claim that the police slapped pre-typed confessions in front of them during questioning and forced them to sign the documents. Speaking with CBS News in 2021, Ligon's most recent lawyer, Bradley Bridge, said that if the case were tried in a modern court, his client would most likely be convicted of manslaughter and given a sentence of 10 years or less. During the early 1970s, Ligon and his accomplices were offered clemency, and they all took the offer except Ligon, who didn't want to be on parole. Then in 2012, the US Supreme Court ruled that life sentences for juveniles without the possibility of parole are unconstitutional. Four years later, the court decided to make the policy retroactive. Ligon won a resentencing hearing in 2017 and was handed a 35-year term with credit for time served, which made him eligible for parole immediately. But he was still opposed to being on parole, so he petitioned the court for his release without it, and luckily the request was granted in 2021. After more than 68 years behind bars, Ligon quietly exited prison as America's longest-served 
observing juvenile lifer. He described re-entering the free world as similar to being born all over again. Now in his mid-80s, he lives a quiet life out of the spotlight. Number 10. Early Release 42-year-old Oklahoma man Lawrence Anderson was originally sentenced to spend 20 years in jail in 2017 for violating his probation in a narcotics case. However, in 2020, Governor Kevin Stitt had reduced Anderson's term to nine years in prison, but he was released after serving just only three years. Shortly after his release, he killed three people, including a gruesome murder of a neighbor whose heart he tore out. What the? Just after a year of his release, Anderson was suspected of murder. Apparently, he brutally killed his neighbor, Andrea Lynn Blankenship, a 41-year-old woman, and ripped out her heart. He then carried her heart to his relative's residence, prepared it with potatoes, and tried to feed it to them. He then murdered his uncle, 67-year-old Leon Pye, injured his aunt, and killed the couple's four-year-old granddaughter. During his initial court appearance, he cried in court, begging for bail. Anderson's lawyer said that he would seek a psychiatric examination to see if Anderson can stand trial. The district attorney for Grady County slammed the criminal justice reform, which had led to the release of hundreds of Oklahoma prisoners. It is reported that the killings would not have happened if he had been sentenced to serve his 20 years in prison. Lawrence is now behind bars in Grady County Jail without a possibility of bail. Number 9. Due to COVID-19 On November 4, 2020, 25-year-old Jerry D. Crawford, who had been serving a burglary sentence, was freed on public health emergency credits to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in Cumberland County Jail. Thousands of convicts were freed early under the evacuation plan in 2020 due to fatalities and rising infection rates linked to the coronavirus. All of those who were officially released were only a few months away from their scheduled release dates. Crawford was set to be released the next month on December 24th, but he got out early. On November 6th, just two days after his release, Crawford and Yusuf Waits were subsequently charged with the assassination of Davian Scarborough. Waits was released from the Garden State Youth Correctional Facility in Burlington County on October 10th after serving his term of a gun offense. On November 9th, 2020, 18-year-old Davian Scarborough's body was discovered beside a gravel road in a meadow at the junction of Burlington Road with Pamphylia Avenue, about half a mile near Southwood State Prison from where Crawford had been released two days before. Scarborough was shot several times. According to court records, Scarborough was seen with two other males at neighboring Burlington Manor apartments leading up to the attack. Security video footage of the complex depicted the two other individuals, who were subsequently recognized as Crawford and Waits. The investigation is still underway, and both Waits and Crawford are being held in the Cumberland County Jail while they await their detention hearings. In this case, justice wasn't served in full term, and maybe a death could have been prevented had it been. What do you think? Number 8. Wrongful Execution Richard Masterson was executed in Texas on January 20th, 2016, despite doubts about whether he had actually committed the crime. Masterson had requested a reprieve based on proof of state fraud and wrongdoing, as well as his innocence. On January 26, 2001, Masterson met Honeycutt at a bar. Next day, Honeycutt was found dead in his apartment. Masterson was accused of killing him. He admitted to placing a sleeper hold on the victim, which led to an episode of asphyxiation. A medical examiner declared Darren Honeycutt's demise as a homicide and stated that Honeycutt died by strangling. Masterson's papers questioned the prosecution's forensic findings, the jury's understanding of the procedures, and the legality of Texas's lethal injection secrecy law. In federal court papers, Masterson's attorneys claimed that the prosecutors withheld evidence showing Schrode was incompetent to conduct Mr. Honeycutt's autopsy. They alleged that he bungled the autopsy, faked his credentials, and testified falsely in the case and all other prior capital murder convictions. It was later revealed that Schrode, who had conducted the autopsy, was indeed untrained and had wrongly declared the demise as a homicide. The two pathologists who studied Honeycutt's autopsy records declared that the death was triggered by a heart attack. Who do you think should be held accountable in this case? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking the video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe button if you haven't already. Number 7. No Records In 1963, Pauline Evans was 24 years old and lived in Wisconsin. She had told her doctor that she didn't need any more therapy for social anxiety. He allegedly provided her with medication during her final visit, presumably to aid her treatment program. Instead, it knocked her unconscious, and he took advantage of the situation and raped her. As a consequence, she claims she got pregnant. She reported him to the police, but she never claims he was not prosecuted because he promised to give up his license. Five weeks later, though, he got it back. When she found out he got it back, 
she went to the medical board demanding why he was reinstated, and the board said they had no records of it. Evans gave birth to a baby boy and gave him up for adoption. With great effort and determination, she overcame the trauma. The psychiatrist died in 1994. Evans wrote three books stemming from the experience of its aftermath, referring to the psychiatrist as only Dr. K. This is a clear case wherein the officials handled the matter horribly, and the lady did not get her justice. Number 6. Innocent In 1975, Ronnie Bridgman, Wiley Bridgman, and Ricky Jackson, three black men just 17, 20, and 18 years old at the time, were wrongfully convicted of the robbery and murder of Harold Franks outside a Cleveland convenience store. The statement of 13-year-old Edward Vernon was vital in the conviction. The kid stated he had observed Bridgman and other two young guys aggressively beat the Franks on a downtown street corner. There was no technical or physical evidence linking to three men to the murder, and they had never been convicted of any crimes before. According to another eyewitness, Bridgman was not even on the corner of the street when Franks was murdered. Despite this, Ronnie and the two others were sentenced to death only a few months after their capture. In 1977, the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, while Ronnie and Wiley did 27 and 28 years respectively. Being released on parole, Jackson did all of 39 years. This was recorded as the longest period a convict had served before being exonerated in all of United States history. It had been disclosed publicly 39 years later that perhaps the child who testified against them sought to retract his statement right away. But the Cleveland homicide investigators threatened the kid. They pronounced that if he changes his statement, he would be arrested and his family would be accused of perjury. However, it took almost another 12 years to proclaim the killing when the boy's false confession and the police wrongdoings were disclosed in a separate court case. The men were finally released, and in November 2014, they received millions of dollars in a settlement to compensate for their wrongful convictions and imprisonment. It's a pity that someone had to suffer the fate of a crime they did not commit. Number 5. Wrongfully Accused In January 1982, a Greenwood, South Carolina resident was discovered dead in her closet by her neighbor, Jimmy Holloway. According to Holloway, Dorothy Edwards, a 75-year-old woman who lived just next to his house, had informed him that she was on her way out of the city. However, two days later, he noticed her parked car in the driveway, so he went to check and discovered the rear door open and observed some disturbing evidence. He entered the apartment and found a massive amount of blood on the ground, a knife laying nearby, as well as an empty bag in the room. He subsequently proceeded to get another neighbor from whom they contacted the hospitals to ask whether Dorothy was there. The other neighbor then followed him back to the house, where he had claimed he retrieved gloves from his back pocket, wore them, and unlocked the closet door. That was when he discovered Dorothy's mutilated body. Holloway dialed 911 and stood in the yard waiting for the cops, telling them the killer's identity might be located in Edward's payment records. Edward Lee Elmore, a mentally handicapped who worked as a handyman at Dorothy's residence was arrested in less than 48 hours when police discovered a matching fingerprint on the frame of Dorothy's back door. A handful of his pubic hair was also found at the site. Bloodstains on his clothing that day were the same as Dorothy's blood type. Elmore had to spend the rest of his days in prison due to the legal battles that ensued. In 1982, he had been found guilty and condemned to death, but the verdict was reversed. After a second conviction, he was sentenced to death and he remained on death row until 2010, after which his death penalty was vacated. The authorities had not taken photos of the pubic hair after the alleged discovery, and for evidence, instead of small spots, large quantities of blood should have been there on the murderer's clothing. It was later found that the evidence had all been planted by the cops to link Elmore to the violent act. Eventually, Elmore was given an option to either face the fourth trial or be freed from jail instantly. He had to sign a plea deal that maintained his innocence while admitting there was enough evidence for the jury to find him guilty. On March 3, 2012, he was finally liberated after 30 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. On December 3, 2018, he passed away a free man. Number 4. Self-Defense In Oregon in 2018, two Utah men were fatally shot during an argument. The men's family came forward to speak out because the accused were found innocent of the killings in 2020. Trevor Gilmore was accused of shooting and killing Justin Severnack, 38, and Christopher Lyon, 42, on Black Friday in 2018. He was found not guilty of aggravated murder and three counts of illegal use of weaponry, but convicted of one count of murder in the killing of just Christopher Lyon. After two weeks of trial, Josephine County Judge Matthew Golly ruled that Gilmore gunned down the two men in an attempt to save himself on November 23, 2018. 
and that Gilmore did not intend to kill Lyon. According to the documents, although Severnak was not armed, Lyon's body had a concealed gun. Selena Borg, the niece of the deceased, had said that their lives had been torn apart ever since the family lost their kin. Lyon's longtime partner, Jatame Carter, believes that no one deserves to die. Moreover, she believes that Gilmore's actions took two men's lives, which will affect them every single day of their lives. According to officers, Severnak had an argument with his wife. She fled their house and ended up seeking refuge in Gilmore's ex-wife's house, where he, Gilmore, was also present. Sometime later, Severnak and Lyon arrived at the house and made their way in, where a few children and teenagers were present as well. According to police, Severnak was shouting aggressively and threatened them physically. Gilmore got angry, fetched his gun from his bedroom, and ordered the men to leave the house immediately. The men refused to leave without taking Severnak's wife, who had run away from the argument, along with them. Witnesses claim Gilmore fired numerous bullets at Severnak during the turmoil, three of which struck Severnak in the rear, killing him instantly, and just one struck Lyon, who officers say was not aggressive during the shooting. Gilmore was then sentenced to 10 years in prison on account of murder and unlawful use of weapons. Number 3. Killer Daughter Andrew and Abby Borden were murdered on August 4, 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Lizzie Borden, age 33, was charged for the killings because she was home alone when the massacre happened and no indications of a fight were visible. The prosecution produced the notorious head of an axe, which was considered a critical piece of evidence. Shortly after the trial, Borden said she set fire to the dress because it was splattered with paint. Despite this, the prosecution was unable to clearly establish that she, and nobody else, was responsible for the parents' deaths. There were reports that Borden had a problematic relationship with her stepmother, but witnesses at her trials testified that wasn't true. Another suspect was never discovered until the investigation was closed and Borden was declared not guilty. While there isn't any doubt that Lizzie Borden was responsible for the killings, she was never charged. Despite being secluded from other residents, she stayed back in Fall River. At the age of 66, she died of pneumonia. Number 2. Innocent? New DNA forensic evidence had cast grave doubts on Odell's killings and rape convictions. Three Supreme Court justices indicated they had questions about Odell's conviction and whether he should also have been permitted to represent himself when they reviewed his case in the year 1991. In 1985, Joseph Odell was convicted for the murder of his secretary, 44-year-old Helen Shartner. She was found on the side of a muddy road, behind a bar, raped, sodomized, and strangled. There was minimal evidence trying Odell to the incident without the blood proof. The Fourth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals restored his death penalty and affirmed his guilt in 1996. The Supreme Court of the United States refused to hear Odell's pleas of innocence, ruling that the judgment concerning juries being informed of the alternate penalty of life without having a chance for parole was just not applicable in his case. Odell had requested the state to undertake DNA testing on other bits of evidence to prove his innocence. However, the request was denied. Despite a worldwide campaign to spare him, on July 23, 1997, he was put to death in Virginia. He was arguably innocent. Apparently, the court had appointed an attorney whose expertise was not criminal law. And number one, insurance injustice. In October 2017, Ricky Melendez was heading to work when an SUV sped through a red traffic light and slammed into his Camry from nowhere. The SUV was traveling at a dangerously high speed, 112 miles per hour, and running a red light. Furthermore, it had also been stolen. According to the police report, four adolescent guys spent the day breaking into automobiles to go joyriding. Three of the suspects in the SUV died in the collision, while another was flung through the glass. Melendez had broken no laws, according to the investigation. Despite this, Melendez's vehicle insurance company agreed to give the boys' families a sum of $20,000 in compensation. It contrasted to the $10,000 Melendez received for his injury protection policy, which was insufficient to meet his six-figure medical costs. Melendez was unable to stay employed since the accident and spent most of his days in a wheelchair. The insurance decision to compensate the at-fault party's family was solely based on financial considerations. $20,000 is a penance in comparison to the cost of defending several cases, even if they are frivolous. Overall, the insurance firm acted unfairly. If you had to choose, would you rather serve two years in prison and be released without parole or probation requirements, or serve no prison time but be on probation for 10 years? Why is one better than the other in your opinion? Let us know in the comments below. And if you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.
拜。